Hi, Kelly. Thank you for being on the podcast. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks, Ethan. Thanks for having me, love. <laughs> no worries. Thank you for coming on. It's great to have you on. So, you're living in Thailand now. Can you tell the listeners what you're doing over there? Oh, so I actually I run a medical marijuana dispensary. <laughs> That's the official term, but I suppose to me and you, I run a weed shop, basically. <laughs> what, uh, so, what? what's it like living in Thailand? It's absolutely amazing. Don't get me wrong, I didn't come out here to open up a marijuana shop. I keep wanting to say green because I keep feeling like I'm on TikTok. You have to be so careful what you say. So um, we actually came out originally. My partner was offered a job with a car company in Bangkok. So it was literally, I've been offered a job for six months. Do you want to come to Thailand for a bit? And we bit, and we just never left. And when, while we were here, the legalised marijuana um, and there was just shops and coffee shops and little bars popping up everywhere. So we just, yeah, in for a penny, in for a pound and just, went, oh, look it, let's open up a weed shop. <laughs> and I've been in this, in where we are now, in the bar for, it'll be 16 months now. Oh, nice. Yeah, so what's it like in the shop then? Oh, it's crazy. It, I mean, ours is pretty much just a bar. We just happen to have a licence for mar- marijuana. They call it a marijuana dispensary because it's it's sort of like they're going to end up going down sort of the American medical route, we believe, where it will be just a walk-in, walk-out, by, you know, like a, like a clinic, basically, like a chemist. Um, but as it stands, there's definitely some... It's like, I suppose it's like anywhere in the world, if you're running a bar, there's always some mad characters. <laughs> um, and... and but I had, as I'd probably got the best reputation. I mean, I have been here that long, so I'm no expert, don't get me wrong. But it's definitely got an old school reputation as Pattaya. But I think the, the marijuana industry has definitely put a different slant on people's uh, perceptions of Thailand now, definitely. I know you've got family back in uh, England, but do you? what else do you miss from England? Proper fish and chips. <laughs> Well, you can get them in, obviously. There's a great guy here called Sean Sharples. He's a Manchester boy. And he's got a nice little chain of um, traditional fish and chip shops. And they are good. Don't get me wrong. They are very good. But nothing beats going to Chippy. No, no. no it really, really doesn't. Yeah, so I know it sounds a bit like a, a bit of a shit answer. But <laughs> fish and chips, yeah, definitely. So what was your childhood like growing up in Leeds? Wow, that's a bit of a bad question. We were jump then, do we? Um, you know, I had a really good upbringing. I'm not going to lie. Just, my mum's always been an amazing mum, and she still is. She brought up four of us. Obviously, we, I'm from Beeston. I'm, I've been brought up right by Ellen Road Football Ground. My family on my mum's side actually have lived there for over two hundred years in that particular area. Really? So my the history for my family there goes goes quite quite a long way back. Um. I was brought up in the 70s, early 80s. Um, so schooling wasn't that great. Education system, I don't think, in the late 70s and early 80s was that cracking. Um, I didn't really like school very much, but I don't think many people did anyway, so I don't think that's going to be a shock <laughs> to anybody. Um, but I, I always, I don't know, I always got on really well with the teachers at school, even though I wasn't, I wasn't naughty, but I was, like, cheeky naughty. As I've grown up and I've worked in schools and I've worked in children's homes and things like that, there's always those like really cheeky kids you think, oh God, but I really like you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'd like to think that I were one of them kids. My teachers would probably disagree, but um, the best part of, of being at that particular school, my high school, was years later I went back to do a play there with a lad who'd also gone to that school, but who was a lot older, but had been off to university. So he was a, he excelled after leaving that school and went to university and did a writing degree and went to Goldsmith and everything. And then when he came back to Leeds and me and him did a play together, it was really strange because we actually went back to, the, the play was about ambition. So we wanted to go back to our old high school and do it. And us both being complete opposite, opposite ends of the scale was was quite a nice touch, I think, as well. But yeah, growing up with I've, I've got lifelong friends. I've I've lived in the same same area pretty much all my life. So yeah, and I was the oldest of four as well. So I always got blamed for everything, and I probably still do. 
Well, you mentioned you've got a big family. Were they shocked when you moved over to Thailand? Yes. I'm going to say yes and no. I can be a bit flighty like that. <laughs> I have got form for just like this. Not like when my kids are little or anything. Obviously, my kids are adults, but um, I don't. I think it was just more how quick it happened because me and Martin had not been together very long. Yeah. So I think it was just more the case of that, and I think it was more because I, I never we never intended to come live here. It it was initially just for six months, um, but my. Uh, my daughter's exact words were, I can't believe you're effing off the other side of the world with that weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> so she didn't really approve them? Not really, no. So but I'm hoping they're going to come out and see me soon because I've got no intentions of going home. So, um, yeah. I, I don't think I did get asked this in an interview recently. Were people shocked that I opened a marijuana shop? I think... That was probably more likely than me becoming an actress at some point. You know I mean? <laughs> yeah. If anybody do knows me from from the good old days, especially the area I come from and the sort of background, you know, like council estate and you know that kind of kind of background, um, which I'm super proud of, by the way. Otherwise, I wouldn't have got a job in Shameless. Otherwise, if I'd not come <laughs> from that background, I don't think. But um, no, I love I love the area. I, I love being from Beeston. It's not the area that it used to be. Don't get me wrong. But I don't think anywhere is. I think we all feel like that when we grow up and and move away and then look back. Do you know what I mean? But um, most of my family still live there. All my lifelong friends are still live there. So I'm 100% a true beast and girl. Yeah, yeah. So did you start off with theatre work then? Is that how you started? Yeah, pretty much. So Mark Catley, the lad I was just telling you about, he went off to university and then came back to Leeds a few years later. So I was about 24 at this point. I did the youth theatre stuff with my drama teacher from school, but it was nothing to do with school. It was just like he run the local drama theatre group. So we did that for a couple of years um, when we were like 15. And then that was that. We all went our separate ways. I had my daughter at 17, had three different jobs, all usual story. And then when Mark turned apart the blue, he was like, oh, do you want to come do this play? I was like, behave yourself. As if... I said, oh, I'm too old for all that now. Do you know what I mean? It's not my cup of tea. So he convinced me to do it. Uh, and it was more of like a community play, community theatre type of play. So we did that for the, like six months and went, did a few small theatres and, and I was absolutely petrified. I'm not going to lie, I just thought, what am I What am I doing? Even on the audition day, because it was officially only open to drama students. So he didn't tell, sorry, that's part of the story as well. So the play he'd done for his dissertation at uni, the play that this company wanted to do, was actually a play he'd written from a story I told him many, many moons before. And they said, the only person I could think about while I was writing it was you. So you've got you've got to do it. He said, but we have to sort of sneak you in because it's only open to second year drama students. So I spent the whole day with young girls who were, were a good four or five years younger than me feeling really out of my depth, really out of place. They're doing all, like, these warm-ups and, you know, getting all... ready. I'm just sat there thinking, oh, fuck, you know, I'm doing here. But then I had a great day and I really enjoyed it. And then he called me and said, right, they've picked you. Then I was like, I'm not doing it. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a genuine thanks to um, the, the lad I was with back, in, back then in my, my early 20s. And he really, really encouraged me to do it. He genuinely, genuinely did. And a lot of people were like, what do you mean you're going to do a play? Or, And it was a bit random, but he was absolutely fantastic. And he just said, I'll help you learn your lines. Don't be daft, of course. Of course you're going to do it. And I'll help with this and I'll help with that. And genuinely, if it hadn't been for him, I don't think I would have done it. Well, that theatre work kick-started your acting career, but you said then you had a kid at 17 and you were working three jobs. Is that how you saw your life was going to be for the rest of your life at that point? Oh, of course, yeah. And I think everybody does at that age, especially if you're a young mum and in that sort of era. I don't want to ask how old you are, but you're definitely younger than me. So um, <laughs> it was just it, a different world back then. The, the one, um, and do you know what? I think it's very much the same now, in, but in a different angle. I don't think kids are encouraged. I don't think kids are allowed to dream or of aspirations or think bigger than your council estate or the, the school that you're at. 
Um, I'd like to think that that's changed up least. Thankfully, there's internet and kids are a lot wiser. But unfortunately, the school rest restraints just weren't available, weren't like that back then. You either you did your careers thing, your little careers lessons to try and work out what job. And they were all the top same five jobs. You were either going to work behind a shopping um, a supermarket, check out, or um, even then, I don't even remember him saying, you know, do you want to be a nurse or do you want to know how to get into training to be a nurse? I think it was just that era. But 100%, never in a million years did I think I would end up doing the job I'd be doing and definitely for how long after yeah. that. So when we did the play, we were actually, it was within the first six months of doing that play and we were in an area called Holt and Mora, um, a women's, like like a little women's afternoon type thing. And somebody went off with our van keys, so we were just outside waiting to pack up. And a very posh lady came up to me and started telling me she worked for Channel 4 and she was looking for locations. Again, coincidentally, she was actually on her way to Bradford. Her car had broken down and somebody had said, there's a play on round the corner. And she saw the last five minutes approach me and said, would I be interested in a film she was writing for, potentially a film she was writing for Channel 4? And I was just like, oh, yeah, of course you do. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> as, if, as if that happens, you know what I mean? And then we stayed in touch for a couple of months and she came up to Leeds to see me. And then before I knew it, within the six months, we'd started filming and she'd got the green light from Channel 4. And then I did Tina Goes Shopping, which was the first TV job. What was that like to work on? It was just looking back. Obviously, none of us, I in particular, none of us had a clue. And because it was... Because it was very much, remember, like, the beginning of all the handheld stuff? <laughs> Excuse me. So for a while, people did think it was a documentary because that's how it was shot. But yeah. looking back, none of I didn't have a clue. I didn't know where my life was going to go after that. Um, but obviously, I was acting in so, some respect. Um, and we just I just paid attention and just did what I was told. And I'd built such a good relationship relationship with Penny Woolcock, the director and the writer, that I trusted her. So we just I was just along for the ride. And then it was after that. So obviously you film, we filmed that and just thought, no, it's gonna come with this. It's not they're not gonna put this on TV. You know, it was just one of those. But a nice experience. And obviously there's a big whole year gap in between now. So I'm just back to my daily business. I'm working in my office cafe. I've got my little bar job. I'm doing, you know, we're all just doing doing this as own thing again. And then it went on TV on the Tuesday night at 10 o'clock one time. And it just went absolutely mental. And then next thing, it had been nominated for a BAFTA for innovation. And so I got to go to this fancy... And, and 100%, this is gospel truth, never thought I'd do another job after that. Really? I thought, oh, that, was, I thought that was fun. Yeah, yeah. That was, that, was, that was interesting. That's something that doesn't happen every day. Never thought even then at that point... It was only when it started to sort of take off and people were contacting me and the original writer and director were saying, I think you need, you want to think about getting an agent. I was still working with Mark, the guy who I did the play with. Yeah. So we were redoing the same play. We we're going around schools and doing plays about ambition and that kind of thing. So I was still doing stuff like that, but not no way did I think, all right, now I'm going to be an actor on TV, not in a million years. Why do you feel that is? Because it don't happen to people from a council estate in Leeds kind of thing. Yeah. Do you know what? Yeah, exactly. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I suppose, yeah, the bottom line is that. It's like, okay, well, this has happened, but no else is just don't really seem that far in front of your face, I don't think. And I, I certainly, you don't think that that's going to be an option or a, an opportunity, really. Not seriously, anyway. Yeah. What was uh, Tina Takes a Break like then after the first one? That one was trickier, mainly. But I mean, the, the kids in it were, were amazing. The three kids. I mean, he's not the, if Muff, the lad who played Muffy wasn't exactly a kid then. I think it was about 14, 15. But the two youngins and some of the scenes they had to do with them kids. Oh God, I felt so bad for them, and especially the little baby, because he he's actually my cousin in real life. Oh really? Yeah, and he's older now. Obviously, he's a grown yeah. man now. And for years and years, everybody said, Kelly, that kid can't stand you. <laughs> <laughs> he literally can't stand you. And it's, it's my voice, because all I did in that film was rag that 
from everywhere and shout and did you know it would, when I think back, I think God no wonder he must have like proper PTSD <laughs> from being a little toddler, but he probably hates me, but doesn't even realise why he hates me. So uh, that it was a lot more difficult, the subject stuff, especially when it comes to kids. And I know they're only pretending, but you got to remember it was quite early doors for me as well. So a, a lot of the stuff, I mean, even scruffing them up and making them look tatty made me feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the two uh, films? Are they, were the people in it actually from? They can't like, they'd want real actors at that point. Yeah, yeah the first one, more so. Um, because it was, I mean, even I was probably the, I wouldn't have even really said I was an actor, I, I was doing a play. So it, it was advertised as non-actors uh, that were telling real life stories, but not about themselves. So all the stories were so penniated over years from different areas, that kind of thing. So yeah, initially then, the second one, there was a couple more, if that one was a little bit more professional, if you know what I mean. There was a few more people in who, who were extras or, or who had worked on that job before. And then there's Mischief Night, which is technically the third one of them films. Yeah, yeah. And obviously in that you've got Ramonte Karam and um, a load of other well-known actors because that was funded by a different company. But I think because that's the style they wanted. But I'll be honest, most of the people she just sort of came across, she spent a long, long time, did Penny Wilcock. She is an amazing writer and director. So she hasn't She's not as like mainstream well known as she should be, simply because that woman don't conform for nobody. She does not take any shit from anybody, but she grafts and the, the work and the films she does are not done lightly. She puts in a lot of groundwork. She'll spend a whole year in that town, in that area. There's an amazing film she did in Birmingham. The name escapes me, sorry, but it's about rappers. And it's, again, very similar to Tina Goes Shopping in its style and its approach. But um, the work she did in Birmingham between these two communities is more than politicians have done in 20 years. These rival gangs have been rivalry, rivalries and dangerous for over 20 years. But she were getting young kids out of each of the gangs and getting them to agree to, for them to work together and move forward. Honestly, the woman's absolutely outstanding. So there's always a bigger social message behind yeah. the work she does, yeah. But she does well, it with such haste as well. She's not doing a look at them grim up north council dwellers, <laughs> you know. She, she doesn't have that approach, and I think that's why her stuff works and people appreciate it more, I think. Yeah, especially then where Tina goes shopping and Tina takes a break, you can kind of, if you live up north in a council estate, you can kind of resonate with it in a way, can't you? Yeah, definitely. And Paul Abbott said some. Paul Abbott, the creator of Shameless, said something really, really lovely to me one night. He said he always knew he could write. He wanted to write Shameless for years. He says, but he didn't want it to be grim up north, Alan Bennett, Ken Loach, that type of genre. He says, and he saw Tina go shopping, and he knew he could write Shameless, and it'd be funny. So that's a yeah. huge, huge compliment. Um, but I think it definitely had a different spin on it. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't like poking fun either or going, oh, look at that. Well, I mean, it wasn't a little bit like, oh, look at them. But I think it would just done so well that, again, like you said, if you're from up north, you you, you, you get it. Yeah, yeah. You get it. Just because yeah. you're not a council dick and you've got to rob Peter to pay Paul doesn't mean that you're a bad person at the you know at the end of the day. <laughs> well, the Tina Go Shopping trilogy, uh, you worked with your dad on that. Did you get him in on it? Well, basically, Penny Woolcock met him one night. We were already set, pretty much set for ready for, to be filming, if I remember rightly. And um, she met him one night and the next day just said, look, do you think he'd be interested? Because I'm, I'm going to write him a part today if, if he wants to be in it. And that was pretty much that, yeah. <laughs> Is it true you went to the BAFTAs wearing a dress that uh, you bought off a shoplifter? <laughs> it kind of goes with a the theme with the, the that's film. That's sort of why I did it. And also my dad would be so tight and he wouldn't buy me a new dress <laughs> and I didn't have any money for a new dress. <laughs> I know that's awful. And yes, I know I've just self-incriminated myself and I've just admitted to a crime. And I'm... Yes, I did. Um, Not my proudest moment, but also one of my proudest moments. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it had to be done. 
I, I played a shoplifter. It, obviously, I didn't say anything for it until years and years later. Uh, and I was absolutely gutted as well because um, I was only there half an hour and it had orange juice got spilled. <laughs> the lady knocked the door and I want my drink, it was somebody else's, and it literally went all down the front of my dress and stained it all night. I looked horrendous. Jeez. And I just spent the whole night just running around stalking people, to be perfectly honest, because I just thought, I'm never going to get to come to anything like this again. I'm going to make the most of it. <laughs> I was going to say, what was that BAFTAs like then? After it, it was, a pretty quick bullet from the start, like, theatre work then you, at the BAFTAs. God, well, yeah, within... So I did the play, that was 1999, I think around August, September time. Six months doing the play... And did Tina go shopping? Waited a year for that to come out. So yeah, within two years. Yeah. Basically, yeah. And then to end up then at the Baftas, and it was just like not in a million years of am I going to this do? I was really, really nervous. She said, "Do you want to walk down the front bit?" I said, "We, we didn't. We actually went like in a little, a little side door." Oh, I'm not glam enough for all that. God, I didn't even have a <laughs> chance to get my hair done or anything. Do you know what I mean? It was just like. I think I, I was working that day and I jumped on the train and it was just like yeah. so fast. I just remember it being a blur, but I do remember just sat like on the chair the whole night, literally just like... <laughs> <laughs> just checking everything out. And then on the... I actually had a list of people I wanted to meet and I still do that to this day. It seemed it become like a bit of a tradition. So like I, on the train or whatever, I'd be like, right, who's up for whatever I, Oh, yeah, I've got to go stop them for a minute. Got to go find them. I am that person. And um, the first BAFTAs, I wanted to meet Sasha Baron Cohen because he'd just started doing, like, Ali G. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they were brand new that year. It, and he'd not actually been nominated for anything, but it, I, I knew he was going to be there. So he was on the list. So a load of people. And for years, I had all these pictures on my wall at home, but my proudest one is the... Sasha Baron Cohen one, and then I met him years later. He actually came to my house randomly. Really? Yeah, when they were he were doing research in Leeds for Grimsby, and my brother, weirdly enough, ended up being sort of like a chaperone for him, and introducing him to like hardcore football fans. And they were over the road at my friend's house, and my brother explained who I was and rah, 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 and that obviously well, we were big fans. And then he just wandered over and come knocked on the door. Just one random Wednesday tea time. I swear to God, nobody believed me. I bet everybody thought I was lying. <laughs> true. Yeah. One random Wednesday, just and then he was like, "Oh, come to see me photo and all this," and it was really, really cool. What are the big celebrities like at stuff like BAFTAs? Are they a bit like up their own ass kind of thing? Or no, they're absolute nightmares. You should see them. They get absolutely steaming. They're just honestly. They are just, they are running around that place looking for people just like everybody else is running around that yeah. place looking for people and going, oh my God, who's there? Or, oh my God, I've, you know, that honestly, everybody is just exactly the same. Is there anybody who is a bit of a twat? Not that I can remember. I mean, I even met Simon Cowell once and he was absolutely lovely. <laughs> it was, it was, I was super impressed with him. Yeah. I don't think there's ever anybody really where I've thought, oh, you're a bit. Yeah, yeah. No, not, not that no. I've come across. No. Who Everybody is... usually has a few drinks. Everybody wants to look all fancy for the night. And then once you get in there and you've had a couple of drinks, it's like the shoes are off and it's like, <laughs> I'm ready to do my head in. No, that can't stay looking pretty for that long, trust me. <laughs> so then from uh, the biggest thing you've done, what you're probably best known for is Shameless. What was that like to work on? What was the... Uh... Sorry, go on. I so, said no, it was just amazing. Obviously, that's probably one of the main questions I, get, I always get asked. And looking back, it doesn't even feel like it was 20 years ago now because everybody still talks about it. There isn't a day goes by where it doesn't get mentioned. If it's not one, it's 10, 15, 20 times a day, like whether it be on social media or just in general day-to-day -day life. Um I don't think we all realised and even appreciated at the time. I think we all appreciate it more our time there now. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I was yeah, looking say, back. Did you think it were going to be as big when you like read the scripts and stuff like that? 
didn't think if they were going to put it on TV. <laughs> Especially that first that first series, especially when we first got to work and there were a couple of, um, like, David Threlfall wasn't the original Frank. Oh, really? There was another guy, and I always forget his name except for his surname. I know his surname is Gallagher. He was an actor who was on Corrie. He played Carla's husband on Corrie for ages when they first joined. I was, oh, God, well, I can never remember his first name. He got cast two weeks for two weeks. Now, from what I heard, everything was, was going great. The comedy was great. I think it was an, a look. From what I heard, it was more of an age thing. I think yeah. he just wasn't looking old, older than it, as, as it needed to be. So when you get a phone call before you've even started work on a big on a, a new show to say, oh, we're just rejigging the cast, you think oh, this isn't gonna this isn't gonna happen now, they're gonna pull the plug. And obviously they didn't and the cast David Threlfall. You can't imagine anybody else being Frank now though, can you? No, that's weird that no, you can't, can you? That is weird that. Did you yeah. go for the role that you got there? No. Oh, did you no. not? No, I actually auditioned for Veronica first. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Maxine I'd Pete. Just, yeah, I'd just given birth to my son. Now this is me saying if I had, a, had just had a baby, I would have got to play Veronica because there's no way on God's earth that I would have got to play Veronica. And when I see Maxine's name on the sheet, and I love Maxine, obviously I knew exactly who she was. Yeah. Uh, and when I was just buzzing to be on the same list for a job as Maxine Big, well, I thought, well, there you go, Mac, that's, <laughs> Max is going to get that. Of course she's going to get it. Um, And then, so I explained that I just had my son as well. It was literally two weeks old. So I said, look, this seems like a very big part and rarer. And also on the other hand as well, I have no nudity contracts and shit. I'm not getting... My dad warned me a long time ago when I started acting, do not ever get your tits out. <laughs> <laughs> so I, would, I wouldn't have been able to go forward and play Veronica anyway, simply because of the scenes that she had. Yeah. And that's not me disrespecting other actresses either. Your boundaries are your, what you're comfortable with doing. I'm just not comfortable like that. But then I auditioned for Jez, the landlady, which I thought perfect size part. I thought, great. Obviously, I've been pregnant for however long. I just missed out on another job. So you're sort of panicking and scrambling a little bit, feeling, God, I've been out of the loop a while and now I've got a baby and, you know, I'm not going to get a job. And so when shame, and thankfully they did, I didn't get the other job because I, I went into labour early because I was due to go for the last audition because otherwise I would have never have even been seen shameless so really? i would have never yeah i would have already been employed so major wouldn't have put me up for it it was simply because i went into labor early um they called and said look well if she don't come today she don't get the job i've told her f off chill fuck off then <laughs> um and then it's like two weeks later my the casting guy's like really sorry that would have been shit what happened the other week but just so you know i've got you in for this new thing so can you imagine if I'd have, if that hadn't have happened, I would have yeah, never yeah. have even been seen. So yes, yeah, so I auditioned for Jez, which was perfect. I thought this is a great, great job to get. And they just offered me Yvonne. I never even auditioned for her. Really? So yeah. I'd like I'd like to think that the thought that was a like middle ground. And I don't know, maybe I had a bit maybe I had a bit more of an edge in my audition to play Yvonne. I'm not quite sure what kind of vibes I give off in audition. So I'm gonna say he played the role well though. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I sounded so evil when I did that then. Um, no, I mean, like, <laughs> it wasn't like you are like, out of your deck for anything. I think you were perfectly suited for that role. Oh, thank you, everybody. Don't say that. I don't know. Because in real life, as you can tell, I do smile a lot more. I am actually quite a nice person. <laughs> but, um, Put it this way, I did need counselling or any kind of therapy when I worked at Shameless. Anyway, you go to work every bit every day and get to scream at people and tell them to <laughs> fuck off and threaten them with baseball bats. You'd sort of get all that negative I'm energy girl, out yeah. of you. Know what I mean? so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you think there'll ever be any more Shameless and how do you think it run its course? I think it's run its course. I think one um they just won't get away with it now. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Just, I mean, if they put that on the table in front of a commissioner now, it wouldn't even get commissioned, I wouldn't have thought. No. Genuinely, not with the, the content and the dialogue and the just everything, they just wouldn't. Um, I don't think they'd ever get David back to do it, I think, understandably. 
he's become the, one of the most iconic characters in British TV. Um, so to then have to actively step away from that, do you know what I mean? And he is yeah. a hardcore thespian as well as is David. Do you know what I mean? He's old school. So that for that role to have taken over so much of his life, I, I, I understand him not probably wanting to ever come back and reprise him. Um, I just don't think, I think it, I think it's standing its own test of time. Yeah, that, like that era of time. Yeah, I get what you're saying there. Yeah, yeah. I really do. And I, I know some of the gags might be a little bit outdated and some of the references, but it, the references and humour, that's going to really stand the test of time, especially, I think, as far as the British public are concerned. And then there's obviously the old school question of what do you prefer, UK shameless or... I'm going to say, yeah. Have you watched the US one? I have, yeah. I've, I haven't watched all of it. I've seen loads and loads of clips. So when it first came out, if I remember rightly, I was just at the back end of me leaving Shameless. So I think, I think I can't remember if it started after I left or while we were still there. I do remember us talking at work about it yeah. and getting super excited, going, oh, my God, who's going to play? Not us, but who's going to play our characters? And I'm not going to lie, I had Lisa Kudrow in mind for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but she'd have made a cracking Yvonne. And yeah, I've said yeah. it for you. She really, really would have. So they were all, I just remember all that talk. And then I, I do remember watching the first couple of episodes back then when they first came out and really enjoying them because they were virtually word for word our version. And that was done deliberately. And then they just went off and found their own storylines. And I do really like the Gallagher boys in the US one. I think they're great. I think the girl who plays Fiona is very, very good. Um, and some of the characters that come into it later on. But I've not watched it as a series. I just, I have just jumped in and watched, um, obviously, the lady who plays Yvonne, but she's not called Yvonne. She's All called... Right. I do know her name. It'll come to me. Shit, what have they called her? It's not Yvonne anyway. Linda. All right, yeah. She's called Linda. And I've read somewhere that's because Yvonne's not a very popular name in the okay. States. Yvonne's a very, very Irish name, isn't it? which I thought it would have been. But anyway, so yeah, I thought it was good. I think it's found its own way and its own path, but it was never going to be. You can't oh, well, nothing be better than the original, can it? Sorry, no. And I mean, they did a good job with The Office, to be fair. I think there's, there is a couple of shows that they've done well, that they have done a good job with, um, but there's only one. There's only one Frank Gallagher. Sorry, William H Macy is amazing as Frank as well. Don't get me wrong, but there's only one. There's only one Frank, as far as I'm concerned. You've worked with a lot of the same actors on different projects. Does that help when you're going into a new project working with people you know? God, yeah, yeah. Really, really, really does. I don't, obviously, as most people will know that your first day on a new job is always the most, like, nerve-wracking. It's like your first day at school. So, yeah. unfortunately, in my job, you get a lot of first days. So, <laughs> yeah. it's even more nerve-wracking because of this kind of job you're doing. You're just rocking up. You've got to hit the ground running. You've got to know your stuff. I I am quite professional, so I always make sure I know everything back to front. Um, But I do get very starstruck. <laughs> so I I'm not being funny and I'm I'm really hope that I don't think anybody has ever said anything bad or like said keep her away from my dressing room. But I am a bit of a nightmare when it comes to stuff like that. Um so I do get a bit overwhelmed when I'm working with people. But so yeah, like for instance, going to Emmerdale, for instance, was nerve-wracking. Even though I'd done Emmerdale years before. Yeah, I'd done another day about nine years before, and I'd done six or seven episodes, if I remember rightly, back in the day. Completely different character, and I only went to the village once when they'd called me back. Um, so I never really got a chance to be nervous because everything was on location, and I met the lovely lady who played Zoe Tate, Leah Bracknell, who sadly passed away now, and a couple of the old school hardcore Emmerdale cast. So that was nice, but um, when I started Emmerdale. When I played Ali, I was really, really nervous. Not only that, it wasn't just you bobbing in for a couple of eps. It was a new family. Um, the dog just sort of brought the kids in already and we were joining later. So they were, it felt a little bit disjointed and don't know. And it was just like, oh, shit, what am I doing? And then um, Chris Bisson, who played Cash. Obviously, yeah, yeah. he was 
been working at Emmerdale for a few years at that point, and he called me. I was just like, oh, my God, I've heard. No, 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 no. Basically told me how much money to ask for as well. Cheers for that, Chris. <laughs> um, because actors don't speak money because everybody gets different. And he was like, don't you be coming here for any less than this, blah, 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 which is <laughs> all I remember to do. And it was nice having that person there. There were a couple of makeup ladies who I knew and that kind of thing, but you don't know that till you get there. Yeah. You walk in and there's always going to be somebody you know. That is the best bit about my job. Every job you'll jump on, I might go do a quick episode of Doctors in Birmingham and I'll bump into somebody off crew who I've worked with on a, a job 10 years ago. You know what I mean? It's 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 a very, very small circle, but it is really, really nice to have a friendly face on set. Very nice. What was it? And, like? and, and, not, and not only that, but then you get all the gossip before you get there as well. Oh, do you like what's going on and stuff like that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what was it like the two times on Emmerdale then? How did you get it the first time? Just a, a standard audition back in the day, really. Uh, I was living in, obviously I'm from Leeds, I was living in Leeds. Um, I, the, the audition just came through the first time round from what I remember. I just did four episodes at the hospital when Zoe Tate was having her mental breakdown. And I was like one of her crazy mates in the hospital who she got friendly with. And then I do remember them calling me like two months later, which was a, a good time after, to invite me back to go do some scenes. Like I've come out of the hospital and I'm going to visit her at the village. So I was thinking, oh, they're going to bring me into the show. Well, I'd just fallen pregnant with my son. <laughs> the same son. <laughs> You know, Jai fucked loads of stuff up for me falling pregnant. <laughs> I'm only messing, babe. I'm only messing. Um, so I did again. I've said then. I'm just letting you know. I'm like four months pregnant, and I'm just starting to show. So I only did. So I probably I don't know. I don't. I don't know for definite if I shot myself in the foot or I talked myself out of it. But either way, everything happens for a reason. And then who knows if I'd have stayed then? Yeah, my life would have been. Yeah, exactly. exactly yeah. And I give that advice to anybody, especially if they get a bit down, if they don't get a job or, you know, we've got, I've, I'm on a couple of actor group chats and it's just like, well, they can going to sick of seeing her fucking work and she gets all the jobs there. I mean, we've got a good friend of ours. She's not going to mind me telling, telling you this story at all. And we call her Taj 10 jobs. <laughs> because of her God. She gets every fucking job. She's brilliant. She is brilliant. But it's like, Sick, Taj. What are you doing? Do you know what I mean? Taj, <laughs> ten job. But um, so my advice to anybody is, if if you don't get the job, it is genuinely nothing personal, and I know that's really hard to take on board. And trust me, it takes twenty odd years to get to that point in your career. But you do. There's you never know what's going to be around the corner. The reason you didn't get that job is because of the next job that has come in. So you always, always have to remember that because it's happened to me on so many occasions. Yeah, you know, I say, well, like you say, you didn't get that first one you went for, but from that you got shameless, didn't you? So exactly, you just never know. You really never know. Another thing I wanted to ask was see no evil, the Mars murders. That oh. must have been area of film, and you played a real life person, didn't you? So what was that? Yeah. Like? It was absolutely horrendous. I can imagine, yeah. I'm not even going to lie. The only reason I end, I actually did that job in the end was because of Maxine Peake. Oh, really? Yeah. Because she, she basically, because I didn't want the job. I didn't, it's not my kind of content. I'm not a professionally trained actor. I don't really necessarily want to play. That subject matter for me in particular, anybody who lives in Leeds, Manchester or up north knows that story inside out. And it's, I mean, I'm really into my true crime, don't get me wrong. But when it comes to that particular story, never read a book, never watched a film, but you still know everything about it. And it's, and then to be asked to play Anne West, especially. Yeah. Um, the lady had only just passed away a couple of years before. I know the families were very supportive about the film and, and there was all this added to and talked about when I said I didn't really want to do it. I'd just also done a job where I'd played a mum whose child had passed away. That was not real life, obviously. Is that the bill? I think that was the bill. I think I did that one. No, it wasn't. Sorry, no, that was an episode of DL and Pasco I did before that. All right. Where my son had been murdered and there was a whole thing. And then I did do the bill. But they all, I did them three in a row. Yeah. And yeah. I can't remember whether the scene of evil was in the middle or at the end. Anyway, 
it was just one of those and I just thought I'm not feeling it I'm going to cry the whole time I'm going to end up making a show of myself and playing a real person in under that and telling that story I don't think I'm qualified I don't think I've, I've got what there's, there's going to be somebody else better who's going to do it justice if you know what I mean and there was a, another actress as well that I, I knew really well and we both realised that we were the last two um Sue the caller, fucking brilliant actress, absolutely outstanding. So I was just like, so babe, just take it. I'm not, let's not do it. She said, you dare step down from this job. And rah, rah, rah. and then Maxine's called me and said, what are you doing? Take the fucking job. I'm playing Myra Indley, you idiot. <laughs> what are you on about? <laughs> so when, when Maxine beeps says, I'm playing Myra Indley, get your ass on this job, you, you get your ass on that job. Um, it, there were... The, the job itself and the people and the production company were absolutely brilliant. Obviously, I have told this story before. There was the main guy who played Ian Brady who made that job absolutely unbearable for pretty much everybody who worked on it. Why? Just horrendous human being. Really? Disrespect. Doing really well in Hollywood now, which is a bit of a... You know, I I I watch everybody and I go, yeah, good for you, good for you. Oh, can I worked with him? That's mad. Do you know what I mean? Watch a load of stuff on Netflix. He he did the whole um oh god, method bullshit. And was making out, he was, you know, getting into character, oh. but he was behaving in a way that Ian Brady never behaved. So it, it didn't even fit with the with his the way he was doing it. The things he would say to people in and in between takes and other cast members and ex, you know, the extras, the supporting artists and crew, and it just got to the point where we didn't. I want to say we had an we had an interaction, <laughs> a couple of interactions, to the point where he was across the courtroom and we're doing scenes, and I've watched him for about a week and I'm hearing everything and I'm watching what he's doing and I'm hearing what he's saying, and I don't like him. And he's been introduced to me as well, and he's been quite rude. The very first time we met, did shake my hand, looked me up and down, scoffed a little bit, just a bit, you know. thought, whatever. It was too early for me. It was like six o'clock. I thought, don't start, mate. I can't be bothered with you. And then um, as time went on, it just got to the point where we were doing a scene. And this particular day, it sort of seemed to have it in for me. And all day was just like eyeballing me and pulling faces and snarling at me and just being really like, awful not in any which Ian Brady did not behave in that kind of he thought he were better than everybody else he, he looked down at everybody he won like shouting his mouth off and um so that night obviously I was super impressed and I remember drinking quite a lot of vodka phoning my mum crying um and then just going to the work the next day and just being like this all day really yeah well, come on then what you got what you got and then Maxine calling me and just saying, is everything all right? Um, you know, just taking a notice of him, basically. I've told him to leave you alone and rather ask. And Maxine's one of the most amazing women you'll ever meet in your life. Not only is she a phenomenal actress, just as a person, she's absolutely beautiful. And um, and then, I, it, I don't know, it just sort of, not like I'd a, I'd, I'd a beeline for me, not in that respect, but I think because maybe I might have been one of the only people ever who's just gone, what are you doing, you big weirdo behaving like that? You know what I mean? <laughs> Just calm yeah. down, you're at work. What, why are you, tra- you know? And then there were, a, there were a couple of things and I, it come to, I think it was like almost like an apology thing. I don't know exactly what he was doing, like reintroducing himself and being, trying to sort of like build a bridge, it felt like. And I was just like, I am not interested in you at all. I think he tried to come and sit with me on the dinner bus one day. And just instinctively, I was just like, don't you dare sit down next to me. <laughs> but it scared me, though. It, genuinely, I've never been. I've never genuinely been so bothered by somebody at work before. Oh, we say just that not, happen often, people being like that. No. no, no, not to that degree. Don't get me wrong. You get the odd diva. There's a couple of times when I've had to go, oh, what's going on with you? They were stuffing your fingers and that. What's going on? Um, but no, I've genuinely, he is one of the worst people I've ever worked with in my whole career. And I and I, I don't say that lightly because I don't go around slagging off people I've worked with, but genuinely he, he, he was despicable. And how, how he ended up, how he's ended up where he is, is beyond me. I just hope he's been humbled at some point and decided not to treat people like that anymore. 
because it's it was not good. And especially on that particular job, if you're going to be a diva, then go yeah. be a diva somewhere else. Don't bring it to such a upsetting, serious subject. Do you know what I mean? Especially when I mean, there were times that the family was on set. Like I got asked if I wanted to meet Anne West's husband, um, and I just I couldn't. Nah. I just couldn't do it. I said I just I said I'm literally just going to cry in his face. I said, well, I can't do that. You know what I mean? I'm just here pretending to be his his wife who's not long past about. I said, I can't. I just, I, I don't know if that's me being not selfish, but I just, it just didn't feel right. I, I felt like an absolute fraud. When you go into something like that, do you do any research on like Anne West or did you just play it out you thought it would have been? Yeah, they did send me a lot of stuff on Anne. I asked specifically for them not to send me any pictures of Leslie Anne. I and mean, obviously nobody has access to those recordings and those awful things that happened. But there are still your standard pictures that are out there of Leslie Ann that I have actively not looked at all my life. So I did ask specifically, please don't send me any pictures of Leslie Ann. I sat for a week and watched every bit of footage and every interview that Anne had done. Um I didn't really have to sort of do like think about in the mannerisms. That wasn't really what was asked of me. And I think they probably cast me quite well to play her in the first place, that I didn't really need to go that. I just did the basic about of her as a person and how she conducted herself through that, that trial period because of all the different scenes I had. Um, it wasn't yeah. just court scenes. I had the stuff with um, who, the Joanne Frogger, who played Myra's sister. There was all that kind of stuff. So I think it was more about how... I mean, you, you can sort of go ahead and think, Oh well, it's going to be pretty obvious how a woman who a woman's going to be an act after a kid has been murdered. Forgot it, but you you really really don't. So you know the poor woman was absolutely broken. Yeah, well, understand. yeah, it was difficult. Yeah, I did I did the 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 basic of what I needed to do for that particular job. Um, anything more after that, like I said, I literally cried the whole time. Not just during the scenes I had to cry in, I cried pretty much through the whole job. To be perfectly honest. Well, another uh, film you did, which was, it wasn't based on a real-life person, but was based on real events, is Faith, the uh, one about the minor strike. Oh, Jay, you have done your own work, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was that like? I worked, I worked on Maxine on that as well. That's yeah, when I yeah. first met her. Oh, is that what you first met that one? I'm just trying to think now, because I'll be honest, I know what years my kids were born and the year I was born, but I've genuinely got no concept of time. I so I actually was... can't really tell you what order I did jobs in. I think that was 2005, I think. Fair. Right, so I already knew Maxine then, because I, I started Shameless in 2003. I only know that because that's the year my son was born. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, I'd already worked on Maxine. But, yeah, the, um, the Minor Strike one, that was a great film to work on. Did you enjoy it, yeah? I really did. Again, the director from that was very much like Penny Woolcock and he'd spent a lot of time researching, ready for that film. And interestingly, what he did, obviously you're probably a little bit too young, it's, it is my era of the minor strike, but I remember being a kid. I, yeah. I, I remember being about maybe eight or nine, possibly, when it was all going off. So I knew what was happening, but you don't know what was happening. So it was interesting for me, the, the, the research that he'd done, because he involved the whole community in that job. So all them extras that you see aren't just paid extras, they are people from that community. And what he did was, it was a really lovely story, a true story inside of that story. So there was a father and son who hadn't spoken, because the, the miners strike split families. Yeah. If you, if especially if you were in the police force and your dad was a miner or vice versa. And this is what this story was. And these father and son had not spoken since back then and he helped them sort of repair the relationship and they were in the film together just as extras but what he did was he swapped their sort of careers so I can't remember which way around it was but let's say the dad was the minor and the son he swapped them over and there was a big walk at the end of the minor strike like no one ever you know the big the big pride walk at the end and um, they got to do that again. And got a little bit of goosebumps. And I know that might seem like really insignificant to some people, but for them, it's a big part of uh, the English history, the minor strikes and the, the damage and devastation it caused to the, the mining communities and the families. So to have that story inside that story was 
So, I mean, people don't realise some of the work that really does go into and the importance behind some a project like that, especially. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Is what do you prefer playing in stuff like that that are real events, or do you prefer the fiction side of things? Fiction. It's a lot of responsibility when it's something real. Yeah. You you know, you overthink it, you you think, well, I hope I get this right, and I hope I've portrayed that right. And I suppose that's not necessarily your job as an actor because there's a director and a producer and everything sort of laid out for you. But no, I definitely prefer the fiction stuff. You get to get to play around with it a lot more. I think you enjoy it a lot more when it's not so much serious subject as well. Yeah, you can have your own take on it as well, like play it how you think from that instead of yeah, yeah. It's unreal. Yeah, yeah. Do you uh what was the bill like to work on? I loved it. I've done the bill a few times actually over the years. And that was one of those random jobs where you've watched since you were little. And then you're going on and you've got um lovely Trudy who played what was the main policewoman? Oh God. Oh, Trudy, she she was Emmerdale as well. Anyway, she was like the main copper in the bill and all the old school policemen in there. I loved working on the bill. I didn't particularly like having to go to London. Yeah. No, nobody likes going to London to work. It's an absolute ball ache. Right. But the people were always lovely. And um, oh, what was a bloody name? June. June Ashton, is that was that it in the oh, bill? She was like the main copper woman. Anyway, but obviously I've got to work with her again years later at Emmerdale as well. <laughs> but the bill had jobs like that. They're they you they like your bread and butter jobs, but they're the ones where you learn the most. Yeah. Because you're in there quick, the work fast. You gotta think on your feet and you learn a lot from the people you are around very, very quickly. So that the, the, the doc- doctors, for instance, is a good example. They've just pulled doctors, aren't they? Oh, I'm not sure. It's been on through the day, didn't it, Doctor? Yeah, I believe that they're, they're pulling it, or it's got oh, it's, it's they're not filming any more episodes, which is a shame because that doesn't get the recognition it deserves. To be perfectly honest, it's a great show, and it's one of those programs. If you watch for five minutes, you're going to watch till the end because the storylines are so quite clever. Kind of like Holby City and Casualty and stuff like that. Yeah. Nice little episodic storylines to and they always sort of hook you in. But that job in particular, so I, I've actually done that job four times to my recollection. And the last time, which was a good few years ago, I said, I'm gonna say no this time. I appreciate the offer, but what's going on? Do you know what I mean? Why have you asked me? This is like the fourth time you've asked me now. And it's a great, it's a great platform for a newbie. Really good experience for a newbie. It's a good if and put it this way: if a newbie can last a day on doctors, that can work at any job in England because it is the fastest pace. They only work on one camera. They'll do eleven to twelve scenes a day. It the pace is insane. But then that's the excuse they give for not employing the newbies. Yeah. So I turned it down again, and then they were like, "Well, we'll just give you, we're just offering you it." And I said, "I appreciate it, but I've done it four times now." And I feel like I'm nicking somebody else's job. Why are you not giving other people a, a, a perfect opportunity? And they said, the pace is too fast, we can't risk it. So it's like a double-edged sword because it's a fantastic job. as a springboard for somebody as, a, as your next level up. And anybody who saw on your CV, well, bloody hell, they'd, they'd, they'd like, if they can last a day on Doctors, they, they can they can do a day for us. Do you know what I mean? It would be yeah. such a great springboard. But it just, unfortunately, it just doesn't work like that. And that's a shame because there's so many amazing actors that don't get the jobs they deserve. Did that help you with Emmerdale? Because that's fast paced. That like every, it's on like every. What is it? Monday, yeah. Wednesday, Friday, something like that. I think they're still doing. I think they still uh, push out more reps per week than the others. I, th- I think they're still on eight a week. Cause they used to do two on a Thursday. Yeah, yeah. Um, not as fast paced as. Um, doctors because at emmerdale when you're in the studio you've got your three cameras anyway yeah yeah. yeah. so it's more a fast turnover rather than fast paced working um, all right yeah, when yeah. you're up at the village as well again slower turnaround just because you're up at the village and there's just a lot more to take into account and everything like that but definitely yeah um to get a job on a soap is more about in even the days filming you've got to literally be an office worker to start up all your scripts because I'm used to just working on one job with one script I'm not used to working on that that's that was the biggest thing to get your head around was 
your three scripts, your three uh, schedules, because you're on three teams. So I can go to work at seven o'clock in the morning and I, let's say I'll do episode one, scene one. Then I'll go up to the village and I'll do episode seven, scene four. Do you know what I mean? Because one, one block is two and a bit weeks and they will film 20 episodes in them two weeks. So if, in that one day, I could be on three different units doing three completely different episodes and keeping track of what I've got done in that scene. Obviously, there's continuity for that as well. But you need to know where you are in your story. Yeah. I, I could jump from episode one to scene 20 in the same morning. So that's quite good. So getting your head around that and keeping track of where you are and your scripts to literally stacks like that. Yeah. And then, and then your schedules, and then you get your amendments and all your different coloured pieces of paper. You just think, I don't even know what fucking day it is. Never mind <laughs> what I'm supposed to be doing today. So, yeah, it, you, that's for me, that was the trickiest thing about joining the soap was keeping up and, and finding your own flow with the way you learn and manage your, your scripts, basically, because that, that side of it's definitely not easy. What was you like with reading scripts and remembering uh, lines? Was that hard for you? It depends. You know what? Sometimes it's really, I think it just, one, it depends what mood you're in. Sometimes you'll get a script and it goes in like that. Yeah. Now that's usually either to do with the writing or the flow or the or the other person's lines. So you're getting some nice feedback and your feed line. Do you know what I mean? So you can learn, there'll be some things you can learn in a flash. Then there'll be other things just think it is not going in. Like, I'm not very good with people's names. I'm terrible with names. And I hate saying names in scripts. Yeah. Because I get to it and I can never, ever, ever remember the person's name. That's a, that's a bugger for me, that one. Um, I think there was only one really bad day that I recall. I'm sure that I've, I've had plenty of days. Uh, or I'm sure directors would say I've had plenty of days. <laughs> Where it's been like, fucking hell, Kel, get your shit together. Just literally, it's the only job you've got is just learn your lines, really. I don't care what other actors say. Somebody gets paid to write our lines. Somebody gets paid to tell us where to stand while saying them lines. Somebody gets paid to tell us how to say them lines. Our job is literally to learn them and, and do as we are told. It's as simple as that. But, um, yeah, Emmerdale was uh, the fast, the pace of it. So... I, I might get five scenes that day and they're all in the cafe. The yeah. hardest ones to learn are the ones where you don't have a lot and then you've got to jump in. Really, yeah. Yeah, because you've got to like really pay attention then. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to do a job then. You can't just be chatting in background and then wait for your wait for your line. But I find it all depends on the job and the context and um the person who's written it for you as well. Yeah, what? it's sometimes there is some day. My worst day at Shameless, if I remember, and I think it was a scene that they didn't end up using. There's probably a good reason why. <laughs> and I do remember, I think we'd had a lot of amendments for that as well, a lot of changes, and I just couldn't. My brain was not just, my brain just wasn't working. And I remember that day thinking, Kelly, you need to get another job. Really? Yeah, it was probably the worst day. It was just like, if you literally can't even learn lines to come at work, what are you doing? <laughs> You but I think like... it was all the changes and stuff as well. And just, I must have just been having a really shit day. And that is the only day I genuinely remember when I think, God, I was shit that day. Really? You seem pretty tough yeah. on yourself sometimes with your acting and stuff like that. Do you feel what do you like, mean? like with that, then saying like you need another job and like, I don't know. I, think, I don't know. I think it's because I never went to drama school. And I, I'll be honest, I've always just felt like I've been along for the ride. And there's always been a bit like, do you know what I mean? Because I've just been dead lucky. And I just think, I, I was just along for the ride. So what's the word? What the, oh, imposter syndrome. There we go. I've been told I've got that. Really? Yeah. Is that what you're maybe. Stuff on yourself, like? I don't, I don't know. Maybe. I suppose I never really thought about it until you just said it. <laughs> <laughs> Make really? myself gone now. <laughs> <laughs> what's you've been your favourite scene that you've done? I know you've done a lot, but it's the one that sticks out. Yeah, I did one, um, any and shameless when I hit somebody with a baseball bat. <laughs> there is a great one because I, I when the fight scenes and stuff, and they don't get the noise right or they don't get the connection right or the angle's not quite right. There's nothing worse 
then a good punch or slap scene that done work. And there was one that I did on Shameless, and I swear to God, I'm not just saying this because it's me. It is literally the best slap scene I've ever seen, never mind the best one I've ever done. <laughs> and I go in, I walk into Jockey and there's a girl and I just drop a bitch slap her like hard. And then say whatever it is I'm saying, it's fucking cracking. It's the <laughs> best slap scene in TV history. <laughs> yeah. What about your work on like casual in um, Holby City? For me, it's everybody asked a lot, oh, what was your favourite scene? Or oh, do you miss Shameless? Or oh, do you miss Emma? It's the people you end up like randomly meeting on these jobs for me. Yeah. That's the best bit. So I remember doing Casualty or Holby. I can't remember which one. If Dave, Dave, I'm going to send you this podcast, mate, so you can see this bit. So there's a lovely old guy called David Stern. And I remember getting to work in the morning and the crew and the casting. Oh, God. That right miserable old buggers are back on today. Just so you know, he's a right mourner. Boy, oh, he's going to do your heading all day, just techno. It was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I fell madly in love with him. It was, honest to God, I had the best day at work ever. And we were like all snuggled up in this little bed together and having a bit of banter. And the man's an absolute legend. And I'm thinking, what are you all talking about? Why are you all like warning me about him saying it's going to ruin my day because he's so miserable? So yeah, days like that, that I always remember the best. So if you say to me like, oh, what's the best day I've done casually? That'll be the day that I met David Stern. Do you miss acting then? Or do you just miss the people? Do you miss the acting as well though? I do and I don't. I miss the people more. I miss, for me, because I'm not like a theatre or um, professionally trained actor in that sort of sense. But I do like making good things with good people and, and the satisfaction you get from that when you put it all together. Like if you do a play and you're absolutely shitting yourself at the beginning and you're thinking, I don't, I'm not going to remember all my lines. And you get to the end and you just think, you know, we did it. Do you know what I mean? We got through yeah. it and it felt amazing. There's nothing quite like putting together a piece of film or a scene with somebody and then watching it afterwards and going, you know, we nailed that or changing it or making it work better. I like all of that. I don't actually particularly like it when it goes on TV and everybody watches. I prefer the process, I think. And I just started to do a little bit of um, directing before I came out here. That is definitely something I want to pursue yeah. more of. Um, but I'm really happy out here. Still a little bit of a spoiler for you. So I'm actually speaking to two documentary companies at the moment about coming over to do a documentary out here oh, uh, about my cannabis business. So there's that. So I feel like my toe might be dipping in. I did actually get asked to direct a play here in Thailand, an English play. Unfortunately, I had to say no because I just didn't have time to commit to it. But the guy does run an amazing little kids' theatre group that I want to try and get involved with at some point, even if it's just, like, once a week, just going and helping out or something like that. Uh, was it called Becoming Better, what you directed? It was, yeah. An executive producer on that as well? That's right, yeah, yeah. That was my friend's book. She's bipolar. She's called Natasha Naomi Ray. She's absolutely amazing, one of the most talented, craziest women I've ever met in my entire life. But the book she wrote is based on her journals as a teenager. And we were pushing it into a teaser to basically pitch it out for a series. So, yeah, I really enjoyed doing that, especially because it was Tasha's work as well. And I've, I've sort of been alongside her through her whole process of putting herself out there in the you know with a bipolar and being honest about it. She's an actress as well. So, obviously, people just jump to conclusions over years about who she is and what type of person she is. But I really enjoyed doing that teaser with her. That was a really special job for me because it was quite important that I got it right for Natasha as well. But, yeah, definitely interested in more directing. Yeah. Um, if a job role came up or for you, a big role, would you just turn it down instantly or would you think about it? Show me the money first. <laughs> <laughs> is that the thing as well with acting? Like, you never know when your next job's going to come, but now you're working at the bar. You've got, like, regular income. Yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't even say regular income. I run a bar and we <laughs> bar in Thailand. <laughs> so I would say I would say income. I'd say uh, running a bar. But um, I'm definitely jobbing actors and every other actor will tell you the same. And all an actor does then is wait, especially the professionally trained ones, 
is, is wait for the one big job. Now, I have been so lucky that I I would say I've had the two big jobs, Shameless and Emmerdale. All the other jobs have been amazing jobs, but I'm probably best, best known for them too. Not many actors get that. No. And then what happens is, and then you do, you get the big job. And then everybody goes, oh, well, you're typecast now. I'm thinking, yeah, and at least, at least I know what, where I'm at and what I'm doing, you know. It's, um, yeah, the, the job inside of it, I don't miss auditioning, I'm not going to lie. I don't miss doing, because everything self-tapes as well now. Yeah. And I'm not going to even believe it or not, TikTok of doing TikTok has actually really helped me with my confidence for self tapes, because there's no way that four years ago you would have got me to do my own self tape. No, no. And then after watch it back and then choose which one I'm going to send in, I'm thinking this is my job. Surely yeah. that's what casting director. I come to you, I do my thing three times, and then I leave, and you decide whether which which one you're going to pick. Do you know what I mean? It's like bloody hell. Was well, that harder for you than actually going in a room and doing it in front of people? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, any action will tell you, you know, entertainer, singer, dancer, whatever, when you're going in for an audition, it's nerve-wracking at best. But the doing the self-tapes for me, are they practical? Yes. Are they financially viable? Definitely, yes. Do I want to go pay 140 quid at the last minute to boost to London for a five minute audition with 100 other people that I'm probably not going to get, but I'm still going to go anyway. So the, the convenience of it is really, really nice. And it's obviously the way forward technologically wise. Do I think they're getting the best out of you as an actor? No. Do I think you're giving it the best? No. You're not getting the feedback in the room. You're not getting the, in the direction oh, yeah, that was great. How about we try it this way? You're just not getting that feeling. And I know from from auditioning people for other things or being involved in that side of it, that most of the, the good majority of the reason why you employ somebody or hire them is mainly for the person that they are. Of course, the acting skills come into it. But a director especially, this is why you get your callbacks. Like, right, they can do the job. Now let's get them in front of the director and see if they can do as they're told doing the job. Do you know what I mean? But th th that all those little processes seem to get skipped now. And okay. instead of seeing 30 people for a job, they're now seeing 300 people for a job. So again, it's, it's you've got to pick the good and the bad out of all these changes. But for me personally, I don't like them. I don't want to spend money on a train going to London either, don't get me wrong, but... I just don't think you're getting the best out of them as a casting director. And I, I truly believe that they're not getting the best out of you. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, in that situation. It's a tough one. It is a tough one because then nerves get get the better of people in an interview. And you can come out your interview and think, I just absolutely just ruined that. There's no way they're going to hire me. And then they'll call and you've got the job. You'll walk out of one audition and go, oh my God, I absolutely smashed that. Phone in your agent, yeah, that's mine. Yeah. I know full well, I yeah. And it'll be like, no, it's enough for us. That you just can't read, but you definitely can't read the situation. And you used to get a lot more feedback after an audition. That's really changed. But again, that's because of the high volume yeah. of people that are auditioning. Without fail, you would know within a fortnight if that job was yours or not. Really? Nowadays, you very rarely even get told if you've not got it. Never mind if you have. Jesus. It's, it's, it's very frustrating. My, I, I know a lot of people who've stepped back from their careers, not just because of these things, not just because, you know, they've had the day or whatever, just because the whole, and, the, and also as well, things like they'll hire you now. Say, say the, there's an audition between me and you, and they genuinely cannot choose. They will literally just go see who's got the most followers. Really? That that's the way that they're going. They've been doing it in the states for a while. Um, that, that obviously social media and TikTokers and reality shows and all this that that w could definitely be a deciding factor because then they're thinking, well, uh, what kind of audience are we going to get? Is that our demographic? Are we going to pull them from social media onto mainstream TV? Right, yeah, we'll yeah. pick them. Yeah, they can promote to have more fans and more people watching and stuff like that. Exactly, and that, and that makes sense. I get it. It makes sense, but it's definitely a different way of working. That somebody of my old time it's not right. age. It's yeah. not right, really, though. Is it if somebody's better? If you say somebody's better, but the goal is somebody with more 
Do you know what I mean? It's well, not I'm not saying they all do that, but I, no, I no, do yeah. have a serious consideration when it comes to casting people for things now. Well, of course it is. I mean, look at, like, say, reality shows, celebrity, get me out of here and things like that. Of course they're going to go for the people with the bigger following. I suppose it's just a, a real life version of a following that people used to have back in the day, just before social media. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the world's changing, the acting world. Well, the whole TV business industry's changing. Yeah. It's very, very different landscape from what it used to be. You know, when, so <laughs> you know when a programme or film would come out that you were in? Would you watch it, like, the night it was out or anything like that, or would you not watch back what you've done? It depends what it was. Like, early doors, like, obviously, it's when Tina goes shopping, come on, we all sat and watched it. Um, when Shameless first came out, I definitely was the thing where we, every Tuesday night, a few of us would get together and just sit and watch it. And then we just did that as because we were fans of the show. Because there were definitely a point where I... I actually wished I wasn't in Shameless. Really? But yeah. I want to be at home watching with everybody else, you know, especially when it went mental. Yeah, yeah. Like, Shit, why aren't I at home watching now? Because now everyone is asking me what's going on. So then I started not reading as many scripts because I didn't want to know what was going on because I wanted to watch like everybody else, which at, at a certain point I could do because I'm wanting it like as much as the Gallagher's. So there were a lot of things I could get away with not knowing about. And I'd see like, you know, your sides when you get to work for your day's film and I'd, put, I'd, I'd only take mine off and, and put, put everybody, so I'm not seeing what everybody else is filming that day. So I think, right, I don't want to know. I'll just, I'll wait and I'll watch. Um, But yeah, I'm not overly keen on watching myself. There's definitely jobs I've done that I've never watched. Really? Like what? Um, So there's, oh, I did a thing called Wolf. It oh, only you... ended up being in one or two scenes because that was mid-COVID. So the script got really condensed down and filming got cut short because of COVID and all that. Um, I've never watched that. I did a, a thing of an epic, a thing called Burn It years ago. Used oh, you were... Yeah, I've seen that at the bus stop. Yeah. Am I at a bus stop? I mean, I've never even watched it, so I don't even know. <laughs> I do know. I do remember being in a bar. Oh, you used to... Wearing a bikini which I wasn't happy about because I don't have a bikini board. I've got the board of a 12-year-old boy and asking for chicken fillets because all these other girls had, like, my boobs and everything and looked right fancy. And I was just like, nope. And then I had to, oh, God, it wasn't even just the worst snog of my life. It was the worst snog ever. Not even worst TV snog. <laughs> Sorry, Kim. I can't remember your second name, the actor I worked with. But, oh, my God, I couldn't even breathe. It was awful. Literally. And I've never watched that episode either. Never watched that. I think there's a couple more I might have done that I've not seen as well. Yeah. I just don't. Like, even if people have got it on it background or I hear somebody on the phone. I was literally at the little market the other week as I'm walking through. Just looked and there's two older guys just sat there. I looked at my faces on their phone. And then other ones spotted me and went, oh, we're just Googling you. <laughs> they're playing videos because they were coming up the street to look for me at the bar. Oh, right, yeah. They were on the street, but it was just like random, just seeing my face on somebody's phone. <laughs> yeah. I don't well, like hearing myself. How did you deal with the fame of like Seamus and stuff like that? Do you know what? It is actually really, really tricky. I know people, some people just embrace it. And I'll be honest, I've been dead lucky. I've never had a single bad encounter or experience with anybody um, when it comes, especially when it comes to Shameless, because everybody just goes mad for it. Now, don't get me wrong. There's definitely times where you just think, oh, please, man, not today. Just, you know, everybody has a shit day. You might not yeah. feel well. Your grand might have just died. Something's happened here. You've had a row with your husband, you know. Your kids are giving you shit, or whatever it may be. And there were definitely days, more so especially then when it comes to Emmerdale, because then that was a whole different level altogether. Mm. So you're known for Shameless is one thing, then being known for the soap again is another story completely. And now that comes with a lot of social responsibilities, which is on your mind. So Shameless, for instance, I can go out in Manchester on Saturday night, get absolutely hammered, probably fall down steps, flash my knickers, end up in the paper and I'll be just fine. You don't, You can't do that at Emmerdale. Do you know what I mean? So the social yeah. responsibility of that is is a big, uh, a lot to to take on board. And you know, if you're not feeling yourself, and you know you're having personal problems or whatever, sometimes the last thing you need when you're running around Asda, 
to buy some chicken is um, people shouting, "Can all right, Ali, or <laughs> where's cash? Or it's, ca it's cash. Well, what's the usual one? Oh, is it's cash somewhere bumming here? Do you know what I mean? Just like <laughs> random stuff in the middle of the supermarket. <laughs> yeah. So I suppose I've handled it as much as well as I can do, where as my boss told me, it's nice to be nice, you be polite. I've been in situations where I've seen other actors not be so nice or not be rude, but have definitely come across as being rude. Um, and that, and, and I just don't think that's a nice way to be. I think no matter what, unfortunately, you put yourself in the public eye. So you've got to, you just got to go with it. Smile, be nice. It takes two minutes and met that person's day and then move on. Because I know what I'm like when I see people. And if somebody were rude to me, I'd never forgive them. <laughs> yeah, you look at me. Yeah, yeah, if an actor or whoever who I'd stalked at one of the dudes, if they were rude to me, I'd, that is it, that'd be it. They'd be like my arch nemesis after that. <laughs> um, so, what do you want to promote anything before we finish? Obviously, the bar. Do you want to tell people a bit more about that? I do, yes. So, I'm based in Pattaya, South Thailand. I'm in an area called Pratam Nak. Now, Pattaya does get a bad reputation, but the area where I am is actually pretty lovely. And my bar is lovely. So, my bar's called La Chosa. Um, we obviously sell green and other things. Our edibles are amazing, by the way. They will literally blow your socks off. I'm not even joking. So please be careful. But listen, anybody is welcome. It's not one of those um, everybody's just smashed and stoned. It's just not that kind of vibe. It's an open bar for smokers, non-smokers. I mean, literally my oldest customer was our lovely man, John, who was 72. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, anybody's welcome. So if you're popping over to see me, just let me know. Nice, nice. And have you got any social media you'd like to promote? I know you've mentioned TikTok and stuff like that. Mainly my TikToks, obviously, Kelly Hollis on Instagram, Kelly Hollis on Facebook. A few of you could go and follow my Instagram because I keep losing accounts because it's really hard to sell cannabis online. <laughs> well, not to sell it online because you're not allowed to do that, but to promote oh. it online and the rules are actually getting a lot stricter. So if you could go follow me on Instagram, I'd really appreciate that because it's really shit at the minute. So I've had to open a new one. But, yeah, everybody just go follow my TikTok, why not? Nice one, yeah. Well, that was brilliant, that. It was great to have you on and meet you. Thank you. Honestly, I really appreciate you reaching out to me, so I hope you're happy with the, the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I love the name as well, by the way. I was telling somebody about it this morning. Clever name, that. Thank you, yeah. It took a bit to come up with, actually. <laughs> and listen, if there's... um. Anybody else that you may be looking at reaching out to or somebody you have and they've not got back to you, just hit me up and if I can get somebody and send them over your way, I'll uh, I'll let you know. All right, thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, thank no, you. No, it is no problem at all, love. <laughs>